In this video, we are again going to adopt a probabilistic viewpoint on machine learning, now in the setting of unsupervised learning via latent variable models. We are going to assume that the data is distributed via a mixture of Gaussians, and it turns out that with such a viewpoint on the data distribution, we obtain a probabilistic variation of the k-means clustering algorithm. Now, the idea is as follows, so we have this, this data, unlabeled data, so we only have uh, measurements x, uh, but we assume they are distributed via some probability distribution that is composed out of a mixture of Gaussians, like some points come from one of those Gaussian distributions which have a certain mean and variance, and some points come from, a, from another distribution. And now we're going to model this in the generative setting. So recall from the, the classification videos that this uh, generative modeling is, is the most is the broadest class of probabilistic modeling, right? Because it, um, well, the goal is to end up with a model for the probability distribution uh, from which these data points X are drawn. So that means once I have such a description of the probability distribution, I can generate new data samples. So that's the generative aspect of things. Uh, but we also have been obtaining such models via marginalization process. So we assume uh, that there is such a latent variable, so the three different classes, and then my probability distribution over x is obtained by marginalizing out this latent variable uh, z. And what we did so far is we factorized this, so we said that this joint uh, can be obtained by the product of these latent variable conditional distributions. So uh, what is the probability of observing an x if I know that I'm looking at uh, my latent variable uh, z? times uh, the prior or the, the probability for observing any of such uh, z at all. And note that this is similar to what we've been doing in the classification uh, case, right? Where we also worked with such a uh, class conditional distribution. So the probability of observing a particular x, if I know that this data point came from the class, uh, well, uh, z in this case, in combination with a prior probability for observing that particular class at all. Now we work in the unlabeled data setting, so we do not really know which classes there are, but we're just going to assume there is such a ordering or structuring in my, in my data, where each data point came from one of the latent variables, uh, and uh, maybe some of the such latent variables are more likely to occur than others. So we make the splitting as follows. So these would be my uh, latent variable conditional distributions, and this would be the prior for the latent variable. And then just as in the classification case, once we have obtained such a, a latent variable conditional distribution and we have these latent variable uh, priors, we can obtain via base rule also the posterior uh, probabilities for observing this latent variable given my observation x. Okay, now let's go over what I just described, but now uh, graphically. So. Um, First of all, this is our data. So we have all these measurements, x, without any label, any information on the latent variable. So we just color coded here in, in purple or pink. Um, so these are just my data points, but I'm going to make this modeling choice, right? I say that uh, this data actually comes from such a joint distribution of a point x and a particular latent variable uh, z. So that's essentially, so we say that this in this plot, the data comes from my distribution P of X, but we make this a breakdown. So we say that actually we're observing a data point X together with their latent variable class, which is drawn from this joint uh, distribution. So whenever we observe a data point, we think of it as it actually belongs to a particular class. So the blue, the blue class, for example, or it, it belongs to, to, to the green class. So every time I observe a data point X and actually also maybe such a latent variable. So that's color coded here, a point with a color. Uh, but then when we do this marginalization, we discard uh, this color or this uh, latent variable and we just end up with these uh, points. So that's sort of a modeling approach. And then we split this joint probability distribution into these latent variable conditional distributions and well, the prior for that uh, latent variable. Where my latent variable distributions are assumed to be Gaussians with a certain uh, mean and a certain uh, standard deviation or a covariance matrix. And then we assume a Gaussian distribution for each of these uh, latent variable uh, classes. So what's indicated here in blue is basically saying a data point a blue is drawn 
from this uh, class conditional or this latent variable conditional distribution. Um, let's say Z is uh, blue. So really what this says, it says that uh, my final data distribution is obtained as a mixture of Gaussians, right? Each Gaussian has its mean and uh, covariance matrix. So those are uh, these conditional probability distributions. And we are weighting these distributions with a particular probability for observing that particular uh, latent variable. So these will be called the mixing coefficients in the end. And these are my Gaussians. So that gives a Gaussian mixture model. Okay, and then uh, because we adopt such a generic a generative model, we can also infer the, the, the posterior probabilities of observing a particular uh, data point set, right? So um, that's color coded to you. So these are the posterior probabilities from my latent variable given my observation X. Meaning if I observe a particular X, I can check for the probability uh, that it belongs to uh, ZS1, ZS2, or ZS3, and I'm going to color code that in this particular plot. So if a point clearly come, came from the blue class, it's, it's colored blue. When it came from the green class, it's, it's green, um, according to my uh, probabilistic model. Uh, but when I'm uncertain, I'm going to mix these colors. Like I'm going to mix the ink that uh, sort of generated these uh, colors. So that's graphically depicted over here. So in, es in essence, this is a sort of K a soft version of the K-means clustering method, right? Because I, now if I have a new data point, I assign a probability of it belonging to one of the classes. I'm not going to say this belongs to the blue class. I'm just going to say with this probability, it belongs to the blue gra uh, class. Okay, so that's the setting of this Gaussian mixture model. Uh, we can use it. Um, well, to model our data distribution and then run it in a generative setting to generate new data points that sort of follow the distribution that we have been observing so far. But we can also use it uh, for, uh, let's say, cluster assignments in a soft probabilistic way. Okay, so then essentially what we're doing is we made these observations of these data points and then we're going, we're going to model the distribution that may have generated this data point, right? So we are going to parameterize our probability distribution in the following way. So uh, well, that's just explained. So we explain this with a Gaussian distribution and this with just a probability, just a number uh, for observing this particular latent variable. And I'm going to describe in detail how we're going to model these distributions. But once we have such a model for the distributions, uh, we can of course maximize the likelihood of uh, my uh, distribution actually describing this data. So again, once we have a probabilistic model, we can optimize it so we can tune all these parameters um, via the maximum likelihood approach. So that's really the principle that we're going to stick to and that's what we're going to do again today. So we're constructing this probabilistic model uh, P of X and we're going to model these uh, conditionals with Gaussians and these distributions uh, essentially with uh, generalized Bernoulli distributions, just like we've done before also in this generative uh, classification setting. Okay, so let's go over our modeling approach. Uh, first of all, we assume that we're dealing with discrete latent variables, which really means that I'm going to assume that there are only k clusters or k classes that describe my model. Uh, I'm going to factorize uh, my distribution with only k, in this example, three uh, different classes. That, that is what it means. Uh, so this is a discrete variable that only can take on the value 0 or 1. So my data point can only belong to one of these uh, clusters. Right? So then I need uh, to describe this probability distribution for the probability that my data point belongs to this particular class, meaning that that's zk equals 1. And I'm going to model that with just this number, uh, like we've done before in the classification setting. So this pi k is really the probability of observing my uh, k class. Okay, so this number should represent a probability, so it should take on the value between 0 and 1. And also, because we consider this as a probability, the sum over all my k classes uh, should equal to 1, right? So this really imposes a constraint, which we have to deal with uh, later on when we actually start to find, uh, optimize for these particular values uh, by k, because these are now my model parameters, right? Then I'm going to model the clusters uh, with Gaussians, meaning that these cluster conditional distributions are going to be modeled uh, with Gaussian distributions. Again, so 
these kind of distributions are going to be modeled with Gaussians and each Gaussian has a particular mean and it has a particular covariance matrix which defines the shape of uh, this distribution. And of course then with these two uh, modeling choices together, so we have a prior and these cluster conditionals, we can obtain the joint probability distribution for observing an X together with a particular um, cluster label or value for the, the latent variable. So it's, it's going to be the, the product of my uh, cluster or a latent variable conditional distributions, which we modeled with a Gaussian and then the product with these uh, priors, which we modeled with uh, these numbers uh, pi k. And then with these two components, uh, we have everything in place to construct a generative model, right? So in the end, we were uh, modeling our distribution for the data point X, which can be obtained uh, via this joint probability for X with the latent variable, the unobserved uh, latent class, let's say, um, yeah, via this marginalization process, right? So we can run this in the generative setting. And um, let me explain that what I mean with that. So we can generate new data points by first drawing a latent variable according to my uh, prior distribution, which I'm now modeling. I have these pi k's. So with probability pi k, I select, well, decayed uh, cluster. Then I'm going to use this decayed cluster to generate a new data point given my uh, cluster conditionals or my latent conditional points. And that then would give me a point somewhere, um, well, in line with the distribution that I uh, had observed so far. So running this in a generative setting would mean I randomly pick a color according to my uh, priors, a blue, uh, green or red, and then suppose I pick the red point, and then I'm going to uh, generate a data point according to my Gaussian distribution and it gives me a point maybe somewhere over here. So then we generated a new data point. Okay, so that explains the generative aspect of things. Uh, but maybe we are also interested in inferring uh, the posterior probabilities for my latent variable. So this is actually um, inferring the latent cluster, meaning that if I made an observation for a point X, I can assign probabilities to this point belonging to one of these unobserved clusters. And this follows from Bayes' rule, right? So we have this uh, cluster conditional uh, times the prior uh, divided by uh, the, the evidence, so my marginalized distribution. So um, if you write this out, it's as follows. So this P of X can be obtained by the marginalization over my clusters. So now here indexed uh, with a J. So this is actually my joint probability distribution factorized, factorized in these two uh, components. So, and if we then insert our uh, modeling choices, so we said the priors were modeled with some uh, number pi k and the conditionals were uh, modeled with Gaussian distributions, then this is really uh, the formula for obtaining my conditional, uh, my posterior probability for, um, well, my observed data point X belonging to one of the, the latent uh, clusters. And for convenience, really, we're going to introduce this new symbol, gamma. So this, this gamma will be called uh, the responsibility. So really the responsibility, responsibility that class K takes for explaining data point X. Okay, so that's an, a symbol that we introduced now, this gamma set K is essentially the posterior probability for uh, my, my Kate class given my observation X and it will be called the responsibility, the responsibility that my Kate class uh, takes for explaining data point X. And in a way it's something like this, when I observe a new data point X, if it's close to point blue, then uh, the blue class is pretty certain and says, yeah, I'm pretty sure that this belongs to my class. So I take this high responsibility for this point. But if my point is somewhere between classes, then both classes, uh, produce a low posterior probability and in that sense take a low responsibility for this particular point. Um, but either way, this name uh, responsibility really refers to uh, the posterior probability. Okay, so we have such a probabilistic model and we have observed our data points, right? And well, we can model uh, now my distributions, uh, which the, with these uh, pi's and the, the mu and the sigmas of my uh, uh, Gaussian distributions but I still have to set those, right? So I have this uh, probabilistic model and now I want to infer what parameters are most optimal, uh, which parameters lead to the distribution that most likely explain my data. So with this in place, I can define the log likelihood and we're going to maximize this 
um, in order to find the optimal parameters uh, that describe my data. So we've done this uh, many times before. So we define our probability distribution, we have our data, so we can define uh, the likelihood and we can define the log likelihood. Um, so we make this IID assumption again, that each data point was drawn from the distribution that we're actually uh, modeling. So then we can make uh, this factorization over all my individual uh, data points. Now, the log of this factorization results in the sum of all these log likelihoods for the individual data points. Uh, but now things get tricky uh, because so far uh, our distributions were relatively simple. It was just an exponential or some other distribution and then the log of this thing gave, gave us something nice. But now we're considering this mixture of Gaussian. So actually we, we have to take the log of a sum of different components. And this is something that we can no longer analytically write out. So really because of this sum over here, the log of the sum of these components, I cannot further, let me write it down. I cannot further simplify this because of the sum. So what now, how are we going to maximize this log likelihood? Now we're going to do this via the expectation maximization algorithm. So we're going to iteratively improve our log likelihood and I'm going to explore, uh, explain that in the upcoming slides. Okay, so this is what we're set out to do. We're going to maximize the likelihood with respect to my uh, model parameters. And so this is the likelihood, the log likelihood actually. So let me write this down. This is the log of the likelihood of my entire data set. So I'm going to abbreviate it with P of uh, capital X. And what we've been doing so far, uh, we maximize this by uh, looking for the stationary points of my log likelihood. And that means that if I, for example, want to optimize uh, with respect to my parameter mu k, I take the derivative of mu k of my log likelihood and set it to zero and then solve it for mu k. But now because we have this complicated expression, so uh, the log of the sum of all these components, I can no longer find a nice expression for mu k because if I take this derivative, I still have something that... Um, depends on all my other parameters. But what I could do, and this is the trick behind the expectation maximization algorithm, I can, I can write my uh, solution for mu k. So, well, it is some expression, and I'm going to keep it still as a function of these responsibilities, z and k. So that's the essential approach uh, behind this. So I cannot find a nice closed form solution for mu k because this, if I take this derivative, set this to zero, uh, solve it for mu k, I still have something which depends on mu k, sigma k, and the other parameters. Uh, but it turns out that we can group all the remaining parameters into this responsibility term. So this responsibility term still depends on my other parameters, so on pi k, on uh, even on mu k, and uh, the sigma k's. But what I'm going to do in this expectation uh, maximization algorithm, I'm going to fix uh, these uh, these posterior probabilities or these responsibilities and then solve for my mu case and all the other parameters. So and then I have obtained these new parameters, I can update my responsibilities and then again, uh, again iterate this uh, solution, this maximization step and solve for uh, the parameters. And I think in the, the upcoming uh, slides it will become clear what I actually mean with this derivation step and how this uh, scheme works. But the general structure is uh, we can eventually find local minima of this uh, highly non-convex optimization problem by alternating the following step. So we can update the expected posterior. So this isn't our final posterior yet, but we call it the expected posterior. So given my current parameters, I can evaluate these posterior distributions or these posterior uh, probabilities. So that's like an assignment step, right? Each data point is assigned to one of the K classes uh, via these posterior uh, probabilities. And then once we made this assignment, we can actually just fill in the, the solutions that we derive from mu k as a function of these uh, posteriors, as a function of these responsibilities. And that gives us the pi case, the mu case, and the sigma case, so my model parameters that maximize um, my log likelihood for a fixed uh, posterior. So in a bit more detail, the expectation maximization algorithm is as follows. So I said we are going to maximize the log likelihood. This log likelihood is a complicated function. 
Uh, because if we adopt the strategy that we've been doing so far, let's look for stationary points, then we cannot find a closed form expression from mu k, but we find something that depends on uh, these gammas, on these posteriors. Now, this is a preview of what is coming up. So I am going to derive how to obtain these mu k's, these pi k's, and how to express this in, in terms of these, uh, these gammas. But this is a preview that shows that we can actually find these mu k's in terms of this gamma. The same for the sigmas. So we are able to find such expressions. So that means that we can actually iteratively update our model parameters. So once we know, uh, once we have evaluated our posterior distribution, so once we have made this assignment during the expected step, we can update our model parameters, mu k, pi k, sigma k. And once we have updated our model parameters, we can update our uh, posteriors. And we keep on iterating this. And this actually gives us then a algorithm which is very similar to what we've been doing in the k-means clustering algorithm. And it is as follows. So we first initialize uh, the pi k's, the mu k and the sigma k. So let's just initialize it with just some random mean and some isotropic uh, covariance matrix. Okay, so then with these initial parameters, I can perform the E step. I can update the expected posterior. So I can update the expected posterior, gamma, Z, and K. So this gamma refers to the posterior probability of a data point uh, X belonging to that particular class, right? So that's color coded here. So we can make these soft assignments with uh, a certain probability. And let's say this point belongs to the blue class and also with a certain probability it belongs to the red class. And in this particular case, we get a sort of mixing of these colors uh, because there isn't a very strong assignment that we can make. Okay, so now we have updated our gammas. And once we have done that, we can move on to the maximization step. So the step that actually maximizes uh, my log likelihood via uh, the, <coughs> the following update rule. So that's the maximization step, which basically says that I'm now going to find my new model parameter. So the mean of my Gaussian distribution and its covariance matrix such that it is most likely describing this particular set of points that are probably belonging to uh, the blue class. Okay, so then we have these new model parameters. Then again, we can update our posterior probabilities of a particular data point belonging to this class. And that gives me this new uh, expected uh, uh, update step, right? And then with this new gammas, I can uh, again obtain uh, my new model parameters in this maximization step. And then I'm iterating this expectation maximization steps until I uh, converged uh, to something nice. And at this point, it's maybe worthwhile to point out that this expectation maximization algorithm for Gaussian mixture modules, uh, models is actually much slower than the k-means clustering because here, only after 20 of such iterations, I am able to find a uh, configuration that doesn't change anymore uh, between uh, succeeding steps, steps. Now I'll get back to this uh, point of slow convergence uh, later on. But this essentially described the expectation maximization step. Um, so this was a preview and I haven't really showed how to derive uh, this maximization step, how to derive uh, these expressions. So that's what I'm going to do next. So we set out to maximize the log likelihood. We take the derivative of this thing, set it to zero, and then uh, define our solution in terms of these uh, posterior probabilities. And I'm going to start off with deriving this expression uh, from mu k. Uh, so let's do that. And before we get there, I want to make this following remark, which is a recurring uh, thing in the upcoming derivation that, well, first of all, we are working with multivariate, uh, multivariate Gaussians uh, to model our conditional distributions. So for a given class k, I model the probability of observing an x with, with such a Gaussian. And now I'm going to take the derivative uh, with respect to mu k of, of this Gaussian. And really here I want to show that the derivative of such a Gaussian is again a Gaussian multiplied uh, with this uh, front vector, with this particular vector. And you can imagine where this comes from, right? Because this Gaussian is this exponential and the derivative of an exponential is the exponential itself times the derivative of the things inside the exponent. 
So that leads to the fact that I'm seeing this Gaussian again. That's uh, because of the exponent. And then we have this term over here, and that's because of the derivative inside uh, the exponent. And this follows from taking the derivative delta mu k of a half x minus mu k transpose inverse covariance x minus mu k. And we've computed these uh, derivatives uh, before in the exercise classes. Uh, so essentially this derivative is given by um, a half times x minus mu k times the covariance uh, inverse covariance times the transpose of this uh, covariance. And because these covariance matrices are uh, symmetric, um, so basically this equals the covariance matrix uh, itself, we end up that we have two times my covariance matrix, not times a half, so that gives me uh, this particular term over here. Okay, so we just derived the derivative of my Gaussian with respect uh, to mu k, and I'm going to use this expression in uh, my derivation for um, the optimization step for, for mu k. So this is what I'm set out to do, right? I take the log likelihood, I take the derivative of it with respect to mu k, and I'm going to set it to zero. That's my objective. So let's just do this computation. So this is the log likelihood. So it's a sum of all these log likelihoods for each uh, data point. Now, the derivative of the log is one over the thing inside the log. So that's what we see over here. And then the chain rule uh, tells us that we still need to compute the derivative of the thing inside the log, right? So delta, uh, delta mu k of my uh, probability distribution. Okay, so let's just fill it in. So my probability distribution was given by this Gaussian mixture model. So the sum of all these Gaussians uh, weighted with these uh, prior probabilities. And then in this term, I take the derivative of the sum of these Gaussian uh, distributions. So the derivative with respect to the, the k uh, mu parameter uh, only returns something when this mu j equals k, right? So we had the sum, uh, but we take the derivative with respect to k. So that gives me this uh, derivative. So that's the Gaussian itself times the derivative of the thing in the exponent. That's what we derived in the previous slide. Okay, now this is going to be impossible for us to solve. Uh, but as mentioned before, we are going to simplify things for ourselves by recognizing that this particular term is actually my posterior distribution, right? And that makes things a lot more friendly because if I now express my derivative with respect to mu k of the log likelihood in terms of these uh, posterior probabilities, I get this uh, friendly expression and this I can solve with respect to mu k. So we only see this mu k now at this point. So we're going to fix this term, which actually still depends on all these uh, mu j's, but we're going to fix it for now. And then we're going to solve uh, for mu k and that gives me the following expression. So we see that for a fixed uh, posterior probability, so for these fixed uh, gammas, we can derive our mu k's in enclosed form. So this tells me that mu k is the weighted average over the points x, n for which cluster k takes responsibility, right? Because these posterior probabilities, uh, I've been referring to them as uh, responsibilities. So these mu k's really provide the weighted average over all my data points within this cluster uh, weighted with their uh, responsibility. So uh, we normalize this sum by the total uh, number of weights uh, within that cluster. Now we can do something similar for uh, these pi k's, so these uh, prior probabilities. Uh, now we want to maximize uh, the log likelihood with respect to pi k, but under the constraint uh, that, my, that the sum of probabilities add up to one. So I'm considering this constraint optimization problem. So I have to deal with the constraint that uh, the sum over all my uh, clusters, so these pi k's, it sh they should add up to one. So I have this constraint optimization problem, so we're going to use the method of Lagrange multipliers. So we saw that in the previous video, we're going to define well the function that we're going to maximize, so that's essentially the, the log likelihood, times love that times my constraint uh, encode this lambda times g of x minus c. 
where this thing will be called g of x and this thing will be called c. So that's the first step in this uh, constraint optimization uh, problem is to formulate the Lagrangian and then look for um, um, the stationary points of this Lagrangian. So we take the derivative with respect to the parameter that we're optimizing, uh, set it to zero, and we do the same for the Lagrangian uh, the Lagrange multiplier. Okay, so following a similar de derivation as in the previous slide, we're going to compute the derivative of the log of my probability. So that's one over this uh, thing inside the log, one over this probability, and then times the derivative of uh, this thing with respect to, to pi k, which really means uh, this normal distribution itself. And then we also have uh, this a pi k showing up over here. So the derivative gives me lambda. Okay, now again, solving this is going to be incredibly hard for a pi k, but we can again recognize this gamma, uh, the posterior probably showing up at this point, because this particular thing over here actually corresponds to one over pi k times gamma of z and k. Right, because if this thing were to be a gamma, then I still need a pi uh, k over here. So we can express this thing in terms of this posteriors. And now it becomes actually easy to solve because I only see this pi k over here. And this posterior is something I'm going to fix. And then I'm solving it. And that gives me the following expression for pi k. But this pi k still depends on gamma, right? So I now perform the first uh, step of finding the stationary points. And now I compute the derivative. Uh, of my Lagrangian with respect to lambda. Okay, so that's, that's shown over here. So the lambda in my Lagrangian only shows up over here. So the deriv derivative of this thing with respect to lambda gives me, well, my constraint essentially. Uh, so that's the thing that I'm going to solve. I set this derivative uh, to zero and I'm going to solve for lambda. And really to come to my final solution, I note that I'm summing here over my classes. I'm summing these posterior probabilities over my classes. And these are probabilities, so the sum over all my posterior class probability uh, should, should add up to one because it's a probability. So these things, so I have the sum of my classes, j is one to k of gamma z and j. And recall that these, um, these gammas, they represent the posterior, so the probability of z and j is one given my xn. So this is a sum over all classes, so this should equal to one for every uh, data point. Okay, so that tells me I'm taking the sum uh, from n is one to capital N of one, so that gives me n, really the number of, of points uh, in my data. So this term will be uh, minus n over lambda, uh, and it has to be equal one because I can move this to the other side. So solving this gives me that lambda is going to be minus n. So, and if we then fill this in over here in the expression for pi k that we obtained so far, we find the update rule for my uh, prior probabilities for my pi k's is given as follows. So it really can be interpreted as uh, the fraction of points for which cluster k takes responsibility. Okay, so we see that if we reformulate this in terms of these posterior probabilities, we get expressions that are actually nicely tractable uh, to work with. Okay, so I just showed this for uh, the mu k parameter, I showed this for the pi k parameter, and we can write it in, in terms of this effective number of points within a cluster, so we really sum over all the posterior probabilities for that uh, particular class, so that defines an effective number of points. I get this nicely, easily interpretable uh, expressions that are easy to implement as well. So I, I derived this from mu k and pi k, but the der derivation for a sigma k uh, follows a similar line of reasoning, uh, which I'm not going through uh, in this video. Okay, and then we're back to the expectation maximization algorithm uh, for Gaussian mixture models. So we initialize with random pi k, mu k, and a sigma k, this allows us to update the expected uh, posterior. So this is called the expectation step. Recompute the posterior given my model parameters. And then if I have defined my posterior, I can update my model parameters actually using this uh, expected posterior. So let's quickly one more time go over this. So we have an initialization. So we set um, 
the pi case, the mu case, and uh, the covariance matrices. Then we perform this expectation step. So we are going to compute the posterior probabilities. So the probabilities that a particular point belongs to one of the classes. So that's the expectation step, which does these uh, soft assignments based on these uh, posterior probabilities. And then once I've made these assignments, I can update my model parameters in this uh, maximization step. And that gives me uh, new values for the mean of the cluster and the covariance matrix. And then we iterate this process uh, until we converge. And as mentioned before, this convergence is, is actually much slower than uh, the k-means uh, clustering algorithm. Basically because I also have more parameters that I'm tuning. And that's, that's, so, so that's the advantage of Gaussian mixture models. So I can adapt my, the size of my clusters by really varying uh, these covariance matrices. Um, but I have more parameters to optimize. And this eventually leads to a slower process uh, of convergence. So what people tend to do is use k-means clustering as an initialization. So that gives me initial mu case. And then by looking at the covariance within my cluster um, and the total fraction of points in my cluster, I can initialize my uh, parameters and then start my Gaussian mixture model uh, optimization. Okay, and then this Gaussian mixture model has some clear advantages over k-means clustering, right? Where k-means, so th if this was my data set, uh, my mouse data set, I have three clusters of different size, really. And my k-means clustering algorithm couldn't handle this because it assumes the same cluster size for each cluster. But with my Gaussian mixture model, I can uh, let my model parameters adapt to the data. So one cluster can be of larger size and the other can be of smaller size. So this issue of uh, several of, of different cluster sizes is solved via the Gaussian mixture model. And then maybe a, a somewhat trivial note on, on how to make these assignments. So once we have converged, so once we have really derived our model, we can talk about these posterior probabilities, right? So these gamma ZK is the probability that ZK is one given my observation, observed uh, data point X. So the most natural way to make an assignment, so if you have to make an assignment, is to just pick uh, the class that, that, that maximized uh, the posterior probability. Okay, so then this final summarizing uh, slide. Uh, so we saw that the Gaussian mi mixture model essentially gives soft assignments in contrast uh, with k-means, where the k-means uh, algorithm really gave hard assignments. This point belongs to this cluster uh, without any doubt. But with the Gaussian mixture model, we can incorporate some uh, uncertainty. Now, we also said that the Gaussian mixture model is more flexible because we can now model a different covariance uh, matrix per cluster. Uh, but we also said that the Gaussian mixture model is slower than k-means. Um, so what you can do is use k-means as a way to initialize uh, the cluster means used in the Gaussian mixture model. Uh, but this Gaussian mixture model doesn't solve everything. It still has the same problems as with k-means that uh, the algorithm converges to a local optimum, meaning that if I rerun this algorithm for different initializations, I may end up with different model parameters uh, in the end. And finally, I want to look back to this uh, classification setting. So when we first moved to this probabilistic uh, view on classification, we talked about linear discriminant analysis, where we actually uh, modeled our distributions with this sum of, of Gaussians. Um, and that led actually to, to linear decision boundaries if my covariance matrices uh, were um, equal for each uh, class. Um, now we sort of looked at the generalization of this linear discriminant analysis via, well, essentially quadratic discriminant analysis where my distributions were able to take on different, differently sized uh, covariance matrices. So maybe it's worthwhile to look back at the slides or the videos on uh, probabilistic generative modeling in the classification setting because there's a lot of uh, similarities. Also now, once our uh, EM algorithm converged, I obtain these, these Gaussian posterior distributions that now encode for the, the probability for a, a latent class, so an unobserved class. And if we would turn this into a classification method, then would lead to um, sort of these quadratic uh, decision boundaries where everything on this side is likely to um, belong to the red class and this side belongs uh, to the blue class. So what we essentially do with Gaussian mixture model is we actually come up with a classification uh, method for unobserved uh, latent classes.